Paul McCartney. How are you? Well, Larry King, good to see you. I have with me George Harrison. How you doing, George? I'm very well, Larry, and how are you? Fine. You're glad to be back in America. Yeah, it's great. John Lennon, how are you? I'm fine, Larry. How are you? I have with me Ringo Starr. Ringo? Sure, good to be here, Larry. <coughs> sure, good to be here, Larry. <laughs> with me, I have uh, George Harrison. How are you, George? All right, Larry. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, today on the plane, uh, there was a trifle bit of uh, smoke pouring out from one of the engines on the way down. With me is John Lennon. John, how are you again? I'm fine, Larry. How's yourself? Gentlemen, it's good to see you again. Nice Larry, to see you, Larry. To see you. Nice to see you, Larry. <laughs> Fantastic, and you know, we'll probably never do another tour like it. You know, it could never be the same as this one. And it's just been, you know, probably something we'll remember the rest of our days. It's just been marvelous. Those are the sounds I will never forget. 51 concerts in the summers of 1964 and 1965, plus a trip to the Bahamas, and years later, a final interview with Paul McCartney and John Lennon. It was a ticket to ride in the most amazing concert tours of the 20th century. As a news director in Miami, I was invited to travel the nation with the young Beatles. Who would know then that they would be the most influential musical and cultural force the nation had ever seen? On the plane and in the hotels, we became instant traveling companions. And in every city, the crowds were overwhelming, the Beatles craving to get close. We have with us Paul McCartney. Paul, uh, we just heard the announcement that in Chicago, where a uh, welcome for you was planned officially and then rescinded by the city because they said they could not control crowds, uh, there will be uh, no official welcome, let's say. In other words... uh, what, how do you feel about this? Would you like to go out and meet uh, the various fans at airports throughout America? Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, like today in Milwaukee, um, we we were told that there were fans at the airport, so it, naturally we said, well, you know, at least let's drive past them. But the police chief said to the people in our, our party uh, that, that we definitely couldn't do that. And apparently there were only about 500 people. I mean, it, and that's not really a lot for the police to handle, 500 people. And especially when they're not, I mean, it's not as though they're a mob trying to kill each other or anything. You know, they're not trying to kill us, they're only trying to sort of see us or something. You know? And it's the same with us, we're only trying to sort of see them and say hello to them. You know? Paul McCartney wanted to get close, and in New York, from their Park Avenue location in 1964, John Lennon just wanted to wave. That's all he wanted to do. John, in a lot of the uh, newspapers around the country, there's been headlines like, Beatles dodge their fans, and uh, really, uh, there's, a, there's another story behind it, isn't there? Well, it's usually somebody comes up and says, the police chief or so-and-so won't let you go. Jump in here and they drag us off before we even... Sometimes we don't even know fans are there at airports because they drag us off so quickly. You know, there's no time at all when we say, let's not go over there and wave. They're always prevented one way or another. Even when they allow us to wave, they give us about half a second and they just sort of shove us in and drag us out, that's it. Well, the main point you want to bring out, in other words, is that, like many people might think, from reading the headlines and not looking behind the headlines, that it's not the Beatles' fault. It's not that you don't want to go out and see the people. Is this right? That's right, yeah. In Australia, we, we must have seen a million, million people there because they let us go. You know, there was still good security and everybody was happy, everybody was shouting, but we still saw everybody everywhere we went. Nobody got hurt and there was just as many people. You think this might be an indication of over-security uh, on the part of fear, let's say, possibly? Well, the uh, police, or oh, whoever it is, are probably worried, you know, but they should think about the kids as well, you know. The Beatles all wanted to get closer, but sometimes it was the fans who got too close. It was in the lobby of the Delmonico Hotel in New York City that a surging crowd descended on Ringo Starr. Three of us got in, you see, but apparently one of the police didn't think Ringo was Ringo, and he just sort of stopped him. <laughs> and that was it, you know, because uh, everyone was... Everyone grabbed him then, and uh, a girl ripped his shirt. Ringo had his beloved St. Christopher's medal ripped off his neck. Ringo, the incident last night where the uh, medallion was pulled off, have you ever faced this before on your many trips? Um, no, that's about the closest I've ever been to sort of being got. Ringo got the medal back, and New York, with two concerts in Forest Hills, was a huge success. 
So much so that even their quiet manager, Brian Epstein, was willing to talk to me about how he felt when he first saw the Beatles. It was at the Cavern Nightclub in Liverpool, England. I was immediately very taken by their tremendous um, presence and um, sort of quality uh, on stage, even though it was not in a sort of particularly conventional uh, either setting or manner or attitude. I never thought that there would be anything less than the greatest stars in the world, and I mean that. And in fact, I was um, quoted as saying this uh, in rather sarcastic quotes in early British musical press. It's difficult to say whether I really thought it would be this big, but I always knew that they were going to be tremendous. The greatest stars in the world that the Beatles were became instant movie stars. In the middle of the 1964 tour, A Hard Day's Night was a box office smash, and what a treat the movie was. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, we were treated to a private screening of the movie. I watched the Beatles watch themselves. John, last night uh, you were very kind and Derek was very kind to invite us up to see the movie, which I've seen once and now I've seen twice. I never invited him at all. (laughs) Just saw him sitting there, listeners. Well, anyway. uh, (laughs) Only kidding, Larry. uh, I'm interested in your reaction. You've seen it many times, but... Do you ever look at the screen, and does it bother you to see yourself, ever? Yeah, well, the, last night was about the worst time, you know. No, not the worst. The first time we saw it was the worst, because the, there were just producers and directors of the film and cameramen and all the people concerned with it. And when you first see yourself on a big screen, you just watch yourself, you think, oh, look at, my, look at that ear, oh, look at my nose, you know, look at my hair stick. And each one of us did that, so by the end of the film, we didn't know what happened, we hated it. And another question I wanted to ask, a lot of listeners asked this uh, before we left, and most of the questions I am asking you are from fans. Uh, when you did the picture, were you very, very nervous at the first? Uh, because, of course, this was your first film. Well, you can see the, the real nervous bits. Normally in pictures, you do things back to front, like the end... You, you make a film of that on one day and then the next day you do the beginning. But in this one, we almost did it in sequence, one after the other. And the first bit we, do, we did was the train, which we're all dead nervous. You can see us, you know, well, uh, pr- people that know us know, you know, that, that you know, we're, we're sort of dead nervous. But the first, but practically the whole of the train bit, we're just in, going to pieces, you know, so embarrassed about it all. One thing I noticed in the picture, and, you know, from being here two weeks, I can... I notice that many of your uh, expressions and uh, ways in the picture are just very natural. Uh, did you find, did you have to adapt yourself to the picture, or was it just natural acting? Was it yourself? It looked like yourself to me. Um, about, uh, say, half of it was ourselves, maybe more. Because, I mean, the director knew that we can't act, you know. Shut up, but they give a tape. <laughs> the director knew that we couldn't act. Yeah, I mean, and we knew it too. That's Ringo shouting in the background. So the thing he had to do was to try and sort of almost catch us off guard, only you can't do that in a film. You've got to repeat things over and over. But he did his best, which he did quite well, to get us almost natural. And the bits that aren't natural stand out like a sore thumb. And you know what a sore thumb stands out like.